kimchi is alive and it's a life force and it's a life itself. It's the most important dish in Korean cuisine centuries ago and even today. I am Chef Ji Kim of Miss Kim Korean Restaurant in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we are here to talk about why we eat kimchi, history of kimchi, the whole nine yards. Kimchi is alive because it is a fermented product. And I think the fermentation is one of the most important aspects of Korean cuisine. Kimchi is as much a, a technique as it's a dish. So it's a verb and a noun. If you say kimchi, everybody knows it means Napa cabbage kimchi, the most essential ubiquitous kimchi of its kind. But you can turn kimchi into anything. And we're gonna try three different kinds of kimchi today. Napa cabbage kimchi, cucumber kimchi, and kachari. Any type of kimchi is two-step process. Maybe three, if you think about the resting period. But really, the technique is two. One is salting or brining, then you dress it to add whichever flavor you wanna impart. And then you pack it away and then let it do its thing, and then you can eat it right then, or a month later, or the oldest kimchi I had was three years old. So we're gonna start with Napa cabbage kimchi. I have really fond memories of making this kimchi, well, or observing my mother and my aunts and country village women coming together and making this kimchi. Okay, and this is a great Napa cabbage because you can see that it's all filled in. The way we salt it is we like gently pry it open and you use Korean sea salt. The kimchi is a seasonal product and Napa cabbage is usually in season late summer, early fall into like a height of fall and that's when kimjang happens. So kimjang is a kimchi making session and it's really laborious. Korean women come together and make kimchi, Napa cabbage kimchi in kimjang season and it's supposed to feed the entire family until about April, March when new vegetables start coming out in spring and then you start making seasonal ones that are less laborious. Kimchi didn't used to look like how you see it in Korean restaurants or Korean town. It's a very like evolving product, but in its core, it's about preservation through fermentation. So when you harvest a whole bunch of vegetables and you cannot consume it right away, and, and how do you preserve it until you last through the winter season, until the next harvest comes? Now that there is like a, a salt in concentrated in this area, we gotta really worry about the entire cabbage, right? So that will happen with the brine. How salty you make your brine has also evolved through the years. And even when I was young, kimchi was buried under the ground to last a little longer. And you didn't have, I mean, nobody has refrigeration space for 50 heads of cabbage. These days, uh, making kimchi is not as common like making it from scratch, even from Korea. And even if you're making it from scratch, you can buy parts. So in that case, the brine does not have to be as salty. It has been six hours. Kimchi, uh, Napa cabbage has been flipped once. Now we can drain it. And you wanna sort of gently, gently wring it out. You don't wanna uh, squeeze it to a point that you're ruining the uh, integrity of the vegetable, but gently squeeze it like you would do like a, a kitchen towel. It's ready when nothing else is dripping, and then you wanna put this on a cut side down on a colander, and then let that drain, and then you make the dressing and then dress the Napa cabbage. Koreans say there is over 200 types of documented kimchi. A lot of differences get decided by the dressing of the kimchi. But there is a general formula to it, so if you understand what goes in formulaically, then you can make your own uh, variations on it. Your must-haves are ginger, garlic, and scallions. Everything else, you can play with. Okay, let's make the dressing. First thing you wanna do is get the uh, chili flakes wet. Korean food is really known for sort of like having spiciness and, and chili flakes. Gochujang, which is a chili paste, and gochugaru, which is chili flake, is ubiquitous in Korean cuisine. But it wasn't really there until only a few centuries ago. Chili peppers, that's from Latin America, makes its way to Korea in 17th century. And chili flakes don't really come 
prominently into play until 19th century. Koreans are not shy about adapting new things and then making it into kimchi and making it of their own. And then next we're gonna use salted shrimp. You don't wanna put whole uh, salted shrimp in there, you wanna dice it up. When you have a jar of uh, salted shrimp, just think of it as another salt that you can dip into. It won't taste like seafood, but it will add a little bit of umami that you won't get from just salt. A little bit of sugar to kickstart the fermentation process. Mu radishes, this is a, a fat, big radish from Korea. Sometimes I describe it as a, a sort of a fat cousin <laughs> of Japanese daikon. In the height of a mu radish season, it tastes more akin to pears than what you think of radish because it's so juicy and so sweet. So now you can see why we need to have the entire village full of women to come and do all the chopping and prepping and veggies because we're just doing one or two head of cabbage and it, it's still like a lot of knife work. Some scallions. All right, and then we add some bitter greens. Here we have some celery leaves. Korean people have this thing called hand flavor or sonma and it's not something that could be easily replicated. That's when you really get your hand in there and then um, the saying is that something in your hand imparts a particular flavor into the dish that you're making. So sort of like mix it all together. It's at this point when the dressing is almost together that you can do extra credit and that is raw oysters. Kimchi is a regional dish. So how kimchi is made, even Napa cabbage kimchi, in the southern part of Korea is different than how it's made in the central region and it's definitely different than how it's made in, in North Korea. Oyster is more like a southern Korean thing. The more I learn the uh, art of cooking, I realize not doing too much to it is also a technique. Not touching it too much, not over mixing it, not overworking the product, when to stop. That restraint is really important as well. And now we dress. Oftentimes the recipes describe this as stuffing, but it's less of a stuffing and more of a painting. You wanna take this pristine, beautiful brine Napa cabbage, and then you take this like robust, spicy, stinky filling, and then you just sort of like paint it, paint it red, fold it onto itself, really tight. The reason why you wanna have a little space is that the cabbage is gonna lose more air and more, and then release more water, and you're gonna see the brine increase. You wanna let it out at room temperature for a day or two, because that's when you're gonna pick up all the fun fermentation flavors as it sits out there, and your kimchi is ready. We are going to do uh, cucumber kimchi and kotjari. Kotjari is a, a catch-all phrase for any kind of quick kimchi that you can make. So this particular kimchi is a, a a fairly traditional one because kimchi is again a technique, you can use any vegetables and this is a very popular one during summer because cucumber is a summer vegetable. And then just a tip on like cutting in general for Korean cooking, we don't have forks and knives so generally most things need to be like possibly fit on a spoon or that you can pick up with chopsticks. So there are mentions of kimchi going like thousands of years, like two to three thousand years. And those are more like a pickle. So, and, and that tradition still survives because if you look at the word, Korean word for pickles, it still has G in it. That often means like fermented of some kind, right? So we have oiji, which is like a cucumber pickle or jangachi, which is a, a new radish pickles. But the recorded version of kimchi really, like documented recipe-wise, shows up in a book called Yorok. It's like three centuries ago. You take these cucumbers that's been brined. You just stuff it right in there. So at this point, it should be flexible enough to, for you to sort of pry it open. Just like, like that. And then put it right into the jar that right in there. And then as this sits, this brine right here is gonna slowly rise as it comes to fermentation. All right, cucumber kimchi is done. Kachari is my favorite way of uh, cheating. <laughs>
<laughs> imparting uh, kimchi flavor to the table without having to like labor over uh, traditional uh, kimjang kimchi. We would eat the long fermented napa cabbage kimchi all winter, but then once the spring rolls around and the sprouts and the herbs and greens start coming out, that's when we uh, make this more. This is as easy as making a dressing. This is the equivalent of what the paste and the filling was for Napa cabbage. And because the things that we're gonna use, like watercress or cilantro or arugula or sprouts, are very tender and delicate, we're gonna skip the salting stage altogether. Rind only on the outside is the direct translation. So even the name will tell you that this is not this is a quick and dirty way to make kimchi. And I have a lot of fun with what I put into this kimchi. I think um, this idea of fermentation, I think you can find it in many different cultures. Even uh, the salted anchovy sauce, Thai people use it, even Italian people use it. And um, the, the history of fish sauce in Italian cuisine like, goes all the way to Roman times, right? So it's not, elements are not unique to Korean culture, but I think what's unique is that we took this idea of fermenting and preservation, we just like went, ran with it all the way. All the vegetables, throw it in there. You can ferment fish, you can ferment meat, you can ferment all the veggies. You have excess grain, we're gonna drink it. We're gonna ferment it and drink it. So I think that that part, how much we ran with it and how much that people are still crazy about it. I mean, we're adding like pickles and kimchi to Pizza Hut. We eat that as if it's like the best uh, medicine because in, in Eastern culture, food is medicine, right? So in that sense, I think uh, it has definitely penetrated into American cuisine. If you ask me if that's the kimchi we have on a plate during spring, yes, but we would also have the long fermented one and then any other pickled vegetables and radishes that makes up at least half the banchan. Those are little things that come when you go to a Korean place. Uh, all the little things that makes the Korean table like a round and communal experience. We have the long fermenting one, we have the seasonal one, and we have a quick kimchi. And you can think of this just like that. So kimchi's alive. Kimchi's a life itself. When it's first born, when you first toss it, to its ripe age of four to six weeks, or it gets older and older and older until three years old. And then it does not die ever because it will come back like a zombie kimchi. Kimchi is like the secret weapon that we bring everywhere, whether it's space or another country. It brings us together and it makes our table complete. Every year around October, Kimchi makes national news. Whole newscasters visiting the Napa cabbage farms and talking about how expensive it is this year. So sometimes um, they would say it's not kimchi, it's kimchi. Kim is gold. 